All right. Welcome back. Uh, we're plugging away on project three. Um, a reminder, I mentioned this last class, and it, by the time we get to our next class, which will be Tuesday at 1 o'clock, it will be too late for me to remind you, remind you again, because uh, Tuesday at 11.30, in my uh, first year seminar class, uh, John T. Harrison will be speaking. Um, he's an electroacoustic composer from the UK. Uh, highly recommend coming uh, to hear him talk, uh, hear him uh, present some uh, some works and talk about his kind of overall output, aesthetic thinking, that sort of stuff. Um, he will be, it, it'll be 11.30 at t in 25L in the library, so if you don't have a class at 11.30, please make some time to come uh, hear this. The reason we schedule it in 25L, that's not the usual meeting time, or meeting location for my Epsom. The reason for having it in 25L so that other people can be there. So I'm trying to spread the word. Uh, if you have, if you know of other people that are interested in sound topics, uh, feel free to invite them too. So it, it is open to anyone. Uh, it is. I'm trying to. I'll have to confirm that it has a cultural event thing on. I think we put that on the calendar. If not, we should. Uh, I'll look into that as well. So bring your ID card so you can uh, check in if you need those cultural event items. Uh, one thing I do need to discuss today, so I've got uh, a couple things I want to cover today. One, uh, if you saw the syllabus, I have on the syllabus uh, project management and uh, uh, version control. Version control is going to be a little more basic than I had initially planned when I put that on the schedule. Um, I also have next week um, my uh, how to speak engineering topics. Uh, if I can start on that today, that would be great, just because that's a lot of material. Um, but it's material that will help you digest uh, readings that you guys are pulling information from sources, like how to interpret all, like some of you are pulling out these books, you're seeing graphs and you're like, I have no idea what that says, and you're kind of flipping to the next thing, basically. Are you seeing these really long formulas with a lot of x in, and then in inside of a bracket, minus x in minus 1 times a, those kind of things? Uh, hopefully I can... Uh, prepare you to better understand those sources uh, with some of the stuff I want to cover uh, over the next week. Okay, Before I get to that, let's talk calendar, because um, one thing that's coming up, if we look at, uh, you don't want to look at that, you want to look at calendar October 2014. Ah yes, the wonderful dateandtime.com. If you don't know this website, they, they have some nice generic uh, calendar for you basically. Okay, so we're here on the 16th. Uh, I've got two, we've got two classes lined up for next week, uh, which uh, realistically this how to speak engineering stuff material will probably take me most of both of those classes to get through. But again, the payoff is that it will hopefully help you in reviewing these resources to understand better what some of these formulas and graphs are actually talking about. Okay, um, and hopefully help you to become a better researcher on this stuff. Uh, the 28th, I think I have available as a work day, okay? I'm actually flying out the evening of the 28th, okay? And I'm going to be gone the 30th, uh, if I go to November now. I will be gone the 4th as well, okay? My question for you guys is with having a work day here before I head out and then two days that you can work where I'm not here, Dylan can be here obviously to help you with advanced max patching and working on your project. Do you feel like you will be ready to give presentations on the 6th, or do you feel like you need another work day with me after I get back and do presentations on the 11th? That's like two weeks from now, isn't it? Yeah. That's, I mean, the 6th is two weeks from today, yes? Let's see. This is today, one, two. It's actually three weeks from today. So the 6th is three weeks from today. The disadvantage is I'm not going to be here for the two work days to give you advice to shift and finagle and refine things. So it's really going to be crucial that 28th before I leave. But my question is, do you feel comfortable just having those work days set aside and without professor feedback? I would love to say that I could respond to questions via email, but where, where I'm going and what I'm doing, I'm basically going to work tech for a concert and recording session in uh, in Switzerland, and I cannot guarantee I will have much bandwidth besides fixing things before the concerts happen on Saturday and Sunday, and then we're schlepping gear over to the recording studio to do a recording session, and then I've got to get on a plane and come back, basically. So 
I, I don't know that I'm going to have bandwidth to answer questions via email. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have bandwidth to answer questions via email. So I want to make sure that if you need questions answered, I'm giving you space for that. So I, it's completely up to you guys whether you want to give presentations on the 6th or on the 11th. I can make it work either way. Uh, let's go 11th so we have like at least one day. Okay. To check in to see where you guys are at? Okay. Everybody feel comfortable with that? It gives you even more time to work on these projects, but they better be super awesome because you have even more time to work on these projects. Okay, makes sense. Okay. Um, what now? Are you working on the patch today? No, I've got material for, I've got material for today, the twenty-first, and probably most of the twenty-third. Twenty-eighth, I'm not gonna, uh, you know, talky talky present material to you. I will that. 28th will just be a work day before I leave. You can have work days on the 30th and the uh, 4th. I don't know. Uh, let's let's plan for you to give presentations on the 11th. If you guys feel super confident on the 4th, I, I I'd be happy to walk into class on the 6th and say, hey, we're all we're ready, Dr. Wallach. Let's go. Let's do this. Let's throw down. Let's talk about processing. Okay. But. I will expect to do one more work day on the 6th and then have presentations on the 11th. I can make that work with the rest of the schedule for the semester. Okay. Um, but that means then machine listening, one, two, three, four. I think we have a full week. Well, no, the 4th, that's, there's Thanksgiving break in there. I think we have classes on the 2nd and 4th as well before the final. It's going to compress the final project but a little bit. But Okay. I'm just pointing out that calendar, making you aware of what we're talking about timeline-wise, okay? Um, but the bottom line, I'm comfortable if you want to defer the presentations to the 11th because you feel like, well, I'll, I'll put it this way. I will leave it in your hands for while you're gone how comfortable you are with these presentations, okay? If I walk into class on the 6th and you guys are ready to give presentations, that's fine. If I walk into class on the 6th and you guys are like, I have no idea what I'm doing, I need your help, uh, I'll be a little concerned at that point because you've been working on it for three weeks. But um, to answer final questions, I'll be happy to do that on the sixth as well. Okay, uh, so it'll be your call at that point, and Dylan can kind of advise as far as are you ready to talk about multi-tap delays, and flanging, and all that sort of stuff. Fun stuff. Okay, okay. I just wanted to point out what we're talking about time-wise. Uh, so. Topics. Everybody knows which area they're investigating, where they're focusing their energies. Uh, I mentioned one must-have last time, which was what? Feature of the project that you must use. Yes, you must use a microphone to process a live acoustic source. Okay? So, and, and we had some discussion, especially with the live sampling group, right? You guys, in terms of you, you must be recording something live on the fly and then looping it and playing it back and sampling it, basically. It's not that you're sampling something from last week. You're, I mean, although you could mix in samples from last week, you need to have some element of live processing, live on the fly processing, okay? Um, the must have that I'm going to introduce today is using a Max project to manage your files. Has anybody dipped their toes into this water yet? You, do you know that this feature is available to you? It's going to change your life, I'm telling you right now. Okay, Max Projects. Okay, um, I'm going to introduce that today. Okay, depending on how long that takes me to introduce today, I will start to talk about these engineering topics and how to dice decipher these formulas. Okay, um, so the Max Project stuff is going to be more interactive where you're kind of downloading stuff and preparing a project so you can get the process of how it works. What's nice about it is it results in a folder with all the files that you need for your project so that you can easily zip it up and hand it in, basically. So rather than having files strewn all over the place and, and uh, trying to manage that process yourself, Max 6 actually introduced this Ma Max Projects feature uh, where it can manage all your files for you and, and combine them all into one structure, okay? Um, so I'll, I'll be highlighting that today, okay? Uh, of course, you know your groups, you know which areas you're working on. Um, this demo is actually going to do some stuff with delays, but I'm going to have effectively a two-tap delay, which is 
pretty basic and you guys should easily be able to go beyond that in terms of more advanced stuff, okay? So that's, that's what my plan is for today, okay? Um, but the, the stuff I'm showing, so just to be clear, the stuff I'm showing, even though I'm using a two-tap delay, uh, the stuff I'm showing in terms of project management should apply equally to filters, to sampling, what have you, okay? Um, okay, so project organization. In order to do this, I wanted to give you some demo files to grab. So if you type this into the browser, it should actually start downloading a zip file uh, from my nathanwallach.com domain. But it's easier to put a little Google domain, uh, Google URL shortener here, okay? That'll make it easier for you to grab the, the file. If you're not aware of this, goo.gl website. It's, it's, it's kind of like um, bit.ly bit.ly as well. But it's just it's Google's version of Bitly, basically. But you should do that. If you type that in your browser, it should start downloading a zip file, yes? If I did this right. You need these you need these files to do the interactive portion of the, today's demonstration. So uh, you could even put just goo.gl slash capital I, capital Y, capital U, nine, lowercase n, capital L. Yeah. It can be lowercase. I think. Sorry, yeah. Is it not an I? Is it maybe a lowercase L? Yes. Lowercase L. It's a lowercase L. Okay, so it's not a capital I. <laughs> So it's lowercase oh, l, yeah. capital Y, capital U, 9, lowercase n, uppercase L. Name in English. What now? Name in English alphabet. Yeah, you know. Okay, so from here, I'm going to break out of my slides and move over to, I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, let me look at my notes here. These... Yes, I've got some JavaScript in here. So what I'm sh what I'm showing you here, I've got some files that we're going to use to build a project out of. Okay, just so you can understand what a project does. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into what the JavaScript stuff, the code itself does, other than to point out. I think I pointed out this out before. There is actually a JavaScript object inside of Max where you can script your own like small scale. Um, Algorithms. If, if, if line coding makes more sense to you uh, and doing a kind of a, a, a small scale algorithm, uh, sometimes it's easier to crack open the JavaScript object and type that in. Okay, um, So these are two examples of little JavaScript files that work with the JS object. We're going to actually make them work with this project that we're going to build to build a two tap delay. Okay, And I'm going to do, I can remember to do this for the screen recording so that it's actually in the middle of the screen. I don't want that open. I want to leave this open. Okay. Um, okay, so let's start by, so if you've got these files, yes, okay, these are files that I've got on my, on my hard drive in my random collection of different fragments, and part of what I hope to point out today is that you, let's see, as you move forward and get more advanced with your Max programming, uh, part of what you should be doing as a goal is starting to build up a library of little building blocks, little modules that you can actually reuse in multiple projects. Okay, um, It's one thing to develop a custom filter for this uh, one project, basically. It's another thing to build a reusable filter that you can then use in multiple projects. Okay, uh, And usually at the midpoint in the semester is the time that I like to try and point students in this direction so they're not just building a, a solution of one. They're building a, a, a reusable module that they can reuse and uh, and lead to create multiple things. Okay. So to show you, uh, I'll do this. Uh, where this is on, I actually have uh, documents, Max pro, no Max packages. I'm working on developing this out so I can actually offer this for other people to use. But I've got patches here from various projects that I've created over the years. Um, yeah, the classics one is the longest one. But these are all max patches that I can, that do very specific little tasks for me 
that I can reuse in multiple projects, okay? And the sooner you can get to, if, if you're looking to use Max over time, the sooner you can get to the stage where you're building these little reusable blocks of code for yourself, these reusable patchers, uh, the happier you're gonna, you're gonna be because you can build that, that custom filter that does it exactly the way you want once and then reuse it in every project then, since, okay? Um, that's really where we're heading towards is building these reusable blocks of code, okay? It's similar to object-oriented programming if you're familiar with that concept, basically, building reusable stuff, okay? Um, Max actually lets you do that, and we're going to practice that today uh, with building a two-tap delay. So go ahead and, once you've got these files, which I've got here, go ahead and launch Max. Okay, so I've got my Max window. I'm going to go ahead and create not a new patcher. I'm actually going to go, if you go to the file menu, you'll see there's actually a, an, uh, an option that says new project. If you haven't used this, maybe, maybe you accidentally touched on this, okay? But what a Max project is, it's actually a superstructure that will gather all your projects, your patches together when you have multiple patches into one folder structure for you so that they're all organized and neatly used, okay? I'm going to go ahead and call mine 1016 in class. You can call yours whatever you want, okay? But for me, that makes sense because this is the 16th of October and we're in class right now, okay? If you want to call it a two-tap delay, you can do that as well. Once you give it a name, okay, go ahead and hit save. And this window pops up for you, okay, which looks rather inconspicuous, other than it has this big plus sign in the middle, okay. Uh, but to just show you what's going on on the hard drive, I'm going to go to my Max Projects for where I actually saved this, okay. And you notice that it created a folder, and you can do look at this on your your desktop or wherever you save this. It's going to create a folder, and it's going to create this Max Proj file underneath it, okay? And that's the simplest state. We're going to start adding things to this now, okay? So the first thing we want to do is add those files that we uh, were looking at before. So right here, there's a, there's a smaller plus sign that says add file to project. Let me get it in the center of the screen. Oop, too far. Okay. If you go ahead and click that, it's going to ask you if you want to add an existing file or add a new file, okay? Let's start with a new file, okay? And at first it's going to feel a little goofy that we have this extra layer that we're adding on top of it, but as we start to add files, you'll see that it actually creates a, a nice structure where it's, it's saving things for us, okay? I'm going to go ahead and call mine main, okay, because this is going to be my main patcher window for this project, okay? Hit save, okay? And now you'll notice uh, two things hopefully. So you've got the project window over here which is showing me a patcher subsection. It's showing me the main.max patch and then I've also got the patch window which you should be used to open as well that has a nice blank slate. Okay, And just to show you uh, that in terms of organization this patcher now lives inside this project. So if I close the patcher window and I look at this uh, main.max patch over here, if I just double click it, it'll open the patcher window again for me, okay? So it becomes an easy kind of like browser window for pulling up this patcher, okay? Again, we have one patcher here, but we're going to add more to this, okay? So let's build a really simple two-tap delay, okay? So I'm going to unlock my patch. Uh, if I want to get sound in from my microphone, which, what, what object do you think I should use? Yeah, easy ADC is going to probably be the, the easiest one, right? The simplest one to not repeat ourselves. So easy ADC, okay, is going to create this object for us. And I'm going to go ahead and increase the size of it so you guys aren't squinting at it, okay? Okay, that's going to allow me to get sound in from my microphone. I'm going to go ahead and plug into the speakers over here. There we go. Um, and now... Planning ahead, I want to get some sound out of my patch, so what do I want to use there? Easy DAC, right? Okay. 
So I'm going to go easy, easy, ah, DAC. Okay. Sound in and sound out of my patch. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, let's see. So the objects for doing multi tap delays, okay, uh, there's, they come in pairs basically, okay. There's the tap in object. And then the corresponding, if you think tap in is the, what do you think the opposite of tap out in is? Yeah. Tap out, yes, okay. Pretty simple, okay. The way this works, they work in tandem. The tap in provides a facility for you to write into an audio buffer, okay? That's effectively what tap in is doing behind the scenes. It sets aside a segment of memory that you can write audio into. The tap out object allows you to read audio out of that audio buffer. So think of it as a little segment of RAM, a little segment of memory that's set aside for recording audio that you can read out of, okay? Um, you do need to specify for the tap in object how much memory you want to set aside, okay? And even though behind the scenes this has to be turned into bytes, okay? All you have to do is say space and then the number of milliseconds that you want to have set aside of, for your audio buffer. So I'm gonna go ahead and say 10,000 this is not 10,000 seconds, this is 10,000 milliseconds, which translates to how many seconds? 10 seconds, okay. If I wanted a minute of, bu of a buffer, how many milliseconds would that be? 60,000, yes, okay. If I want two minutes of a buffer, how many, how many milliseconds would that be? 120, okay, 120,000, okay. So because it's measured in milliseconds, once you get into bigger buffers, which might be the domain of uh, your live sampling group as well uh, as perhaps the multi-tap delays basically you can you can ha play around with some really long buffers okay and actually this buffer can be as big as your memory is basically so the, the fact that we have gigabytes of memory you could have a there's no pr max has no problem with you having a 10 minute buffer set aside for for tapping in and out of okay which is part of the beauty of being able to program these things yourself okay so the tap in and tap out objects are only going to communicate with each other if we connect them. So go ahead and connect the outlet of tap in to the inlet of tap out. Okay. What that tells Max is that we actually want this tap out to be reading from the audio buffer that's been set aside by this tap in. Okay. So they're now working in tandem by making that connection. Okay. We're gonna um, the tap out then specifies as it says, the initial delay, okay, uh, or the initial state that you want, how much you want to delay the audio. I'm going to go ahead and say 100 as, a, as, a, as an initial point, okay, and again, this is 100 milliseconds, okay. As long as this 100 is not any bigger than this, uh, this argument on the tap out, we're fine, okay. Um, so that's one reason for setting this tap in maybe bigger than you're actually going to need because you don't want to make sure you want to make sure you don't exceed this number. Okay, um, not that it's a huge catastrophic thing that's going to happen like crash your computer, but uh, you think about it this way: it's setting aside memory underneath the surface. If you try to exceed the bounds of that memory, it could potentially cause problems where you're outside of the memory. I, I, I'm pretty sure Max actually handles it and makes sure that you stay within that little block of memory. Okay, um, but the 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 motivation here is to stay within the size of this uh, maximum. You can think of this this tap out argument as the maximum delay that you can create. Okay. So think big here as far as how big you want your, de your delay to be, okay? So, okay, so now we want to actually, uh, we said we want to do a two-tap delay, okay? So, yep, it's okay. The, the tap in is not where we created uh, the two taps. The tap out is actually where we create the two taps. And if you go ahead and just duplicate this tap out and connect it again to the tap in, you now have two taps out of your delay line. Okay. And we're gonna we'll hear how this sounds in a minute. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and give this one a different delay time. Uh, something obvious like three hundred. No, not three thousand. Shoot, what did I do? There. I'm gonna do three hundred here, just so it, it's far enough. The the numbers are far enough apart that I can hear an audible difference. That's the point here. Okay. Uh, and now I want to connect these to my output. 
but instead of just connecting st strictly the delay, okay, delays are only as good as the original signal that you compare them to, okay. By which I mean, if you only delay the signal and don't mix in the original undelayed signal, you're not going to hear the fact that well, you'll hear the fact that it's delayed, but you won't have a point of reference, okay. So think of the original signal as your point of reference for the delay. You, you need that original signal in there in order to hear that it's going, hey, 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 okay? Uh, without, if I delete the original hey and I just go, hey, 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 okay, hey, 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 okay? You, it, it, it's that um, original signal that becomes kind of the ground for you to judge the rest of them as delays. Yeah. Is that what a dry signal is? Yeah, you can think of it as the dry as being the original signal, the wet being the delayed signal. Okay. Yeah. So if you if you're reading things about wet dry mix, that's what it's talking about. Um, so delays, wet dry mix is very important. So the thing that I like to use for mixing uh, mixing signals, and to get in the habit of using for mixing signals is the plus objects, right? Because effectively, addition is mixing signals. When you're adding, well, I mean, in production, right, when you're adding the singer to the guitar, well, I, should, I said that backwards. When you're mixing the singer with the guitar, what you're doing is you're adding one signal to the other, okay? And so max is very ex explicit in that you, you specify it as an addition object with a tilde, okay? Um, I now want to mix that with my original signal, and so this is where uh, 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 this, you may find that this doesn't work for you and doesn't compute with your brain, but for me, anytime I have a, sit, a point where I'm going to split the signal, I like to add in a plus object because that gives me flexibility to later mix in another signal. So I'm going to do this to route my dry signal, and in fact, let's do this. My, I'm, my little patch is getting a little cramped here. Just so we're clear on what we're doing here. This is the, we've got the dry, and then we've got the wet down here. And here is where we're actually mixing dry plus wet. Okay, just to be really explicit about what we're doing. Okay, so I've got I've got it mixed in with one of my taps. I'm going to mix it in with my other tap, and I'm going to use my multi-point connections to get back around here. And I, I, I don't know, I'm a perfectionist. I like to do this so that things aren't crossing. Uh, this, although this looks a little goofy to me with this patch cord out here, but I can rearrange things, OK? And if you don't have multi-point uh, patch cords on, I think I've covered this before, yes? Uh, segmented patch cords, that's what you want. Options up there, okay. Shift, okay. Uh, once you've got it on, I, I, yeah, I have to turn it off and, and try that though, okay. So I'm going to now use the this as my left channel output, this as my right channel output, and congratulations, we've just built a two tap delay. Ooh, wait, I need to do this, don't I? Boop. Different delays need to come out of different. Different speakers, yes. Yeah. So one thing I just noticed that I missed here, the dry signal here needs to go into the tap in as well. So why why do you think I put this plus here at the start? I mean, as a kind of point to have things go out from. Why would I want to do that? I mean, I, right now I'm mixing a signal of one. My microphone. Yeah, if I go, yeah, and you're. Yeah, yeah. So this this allows me to have a single point where I can add more single signals at a later at a later date or a later hour or a later minute. Okay, if I decide five minutes from now that I want to add a, I, I don't suggest you do this, but if I just decided that I wanted to have a, a sine wave mixed in here. If I didn't have this plus object right here, I would have to patch it here and here and here to make sure it's it's mixed in the same way as my microphone signal, as opposed to because I started with a plus sign, all I have to do is make one connection. Okay? 
And so it's, it's thinking ahead to the fact that I might want to mix multiple signals in there. Okay. So if I turn this on, and actually you guys should be able to do this too, if I turn this on, I'm now, hello, today I consider myself the luckiest man, okay, part of the Yankees, okay, anyway, sorry. Um, so you got this, kind of, this nice little stadium effect just by creating two taps. Okay, and the only reason we're getting, there's no feedback going on in this uh, patch. So the, the multiple echoes is only because this speaker is close to this microphone, so it's feeding in acoustically. Okay. Test. Test. Okay. So everybody hear how the, ec the echo effect is working? It only echoes twice. It should only echo twice. And, uh, okay, so to prove that point, let me do this. Uh, blah, 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 blah. What's an easy way for me to... When it, I have another question now. Yeah. But like, uh, when, you tap, when it taps up at 300 milliseconds, like it sounds quieter. Is that because it, it uh, uses it when it's at, like the certain, like at 300 seconds, the, it's quieter? So it samples that the quieter. That I don't think that's what's going on. I think that this the 100 is louder because it's closer to the speaker, and it's also closer. 100 milliseconds is closer in time to the original, so it's actually your your brain's hearing both of them in close succession. So it's kind of grouping them together. It sounds louder, as opposed to the 300 is farther away in time. Uh, let's do it this way, just to kind of prove my point. If I start increasing these numbers, one one second and three seconds. Okay, I turn it back on. Test. 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 Signal. 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 Hello. Hello. Okay. Does that make it easier for you to hear what the echoes are? It's all the same volume. Yeah, it's pretty much all the same volume. It's just that you were hearing. Uh, the original plus the 100 millisecond echo, and it's so close that your brain is just, that sounds louder, basically. Um, and if you get inside a certain zone, your, your brain actually can't hear the echo. And it is your brain, not your ear, because your ear will actually distinguish things that are in close succession. It, it's, it actually, there's a function in your brain called the precedence effect that suppresses things that are too close in time, so you only hear one, the first arriving sound. So, and we're getting into psychoacoustics. But, I, but, okay, so we need to get to, uh, which, which is fine. I'm happy to talk about psychoacoustics, but uh, I want to teach you how to use Max Projects. Okay, so we've created this main patch. Go ahead and save it now. Okay. Okay, and hopefully some of you, and I'm looking at my, okay, encapsulation, that's the first thing I want to cover. Hopefully some of you have figured this out by now. So go ahead and select all these objects. And encapsulate, yes. Some, hopefully some of you have been using this function, yes. To gather things together, see what it does. It basically takes all those objects and moves them into a subpatcher. Okay, so if I, uh, if I lock my patch and then double click, what happens inside here is that it's moved all my objects that were at the top level into a what's called a sub patcher. Okay, so this is a this is a good way to start organizing your patches. I know I've seen some of some groups doing this, but I just want to be explicit here and share this with you that that this is a good way to start to organize your patches. Okay, um, what you see here are inlet objects. So Max actually has objects to allow you to pa pass a signal into a patch and outlet objects that allow you to pass a signal out of a patch. Okay? And so you see these brown ones are inlets, these blue ones are outlets, and I can make this a little bit bigger. There. Okay? So that's your sub patch. Okay? And the, it creates this P at the top level, but very quickly you should give this a name. I'm going to go ahead and call it two tap delay. Okay, because if you just leave it P, you're not going to know what's inside that sub patch. Okay, 
so as great as encapsulation is in terms of uh, creating uh, more organized patches, if you don't start labeling these things, and labeling it here doesn't change the functionality of the subpatch, by the way, okay? Okay. Once it's encapsulated like this, you can actually duplicate this. So if I just option click drag, I can create two two tap delays. Uh, 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 I have four taps now, okay? And I can I can do this. I can wire these backwards if I want to now. And turn it on. Test. 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 Getting some ringing. But you're hearing the feedback kind of smear and delay, basically, so you can get some interesting effects. Okay, so then I, so you see how easy that was now for me to take what what was one, two, three, four, five, six objects, and I can easily duplicate it by just encapsulating it and then doing the option click drag, or I can copy and paste, or I can I can copy it from here and paste it into another patch. Okay, um, that's. A nice functionality. Okay, here's the problem with subpatchers. If I open up this subpatch and I say, you know what, I don't want this to be 3,000. I want this to actually be 300 again, and I want this one to be instead of 1,000. I'm going to make this 1,500. Okay, I close that. Okay, I just edited this one here. I didn't edit this one here. I've given. They have the same name. Your thought process will be that, oh, I've, I've now maybe made an edit to both of these, okay, because they have the same name. But in fact, if I double-click this one, you'll see it still says 1,000 and 3,000, okay. So even though they have the same name, if it has a P in front of it, it's a, pa it's a local sub-patcher, and it is a unique entity, even though it has its own name, that might be the same, okay. So this is where this this is where encapsulation starts to break down and, and keeping things local within the same patch in the sub patcher, the p space the name of it okay, because if I edit the edit, let's see, the edits performed on one instance don't transfer to other instances okay, the way we need to do to be able to do that okay because eventually as I said at the outset the the goal here is to create u reusable bits of code right that are the same every time you load them and they're predictable and they perform exactly the way you want them, okay? So the way you do that, okay, if you just double click on this, okay, open this sub patch up, okay? And if you decide that 1500 and, three, uh, 1500 and 300 is the perfect bit, that's great, okay? Once this is now the frontmost patch, you should be able to go file, save, and now it's gonna do that. I'll do save as. There we go. So file save as. Go ahead and do this with me here. So again, I mean, do I need to step through that again? What I did was I double clicked on the abstraction I had to open it up and then I did a file save as. You notice this now says dot max patch on it and this is actually going to save it as a file on the hard drive separate from the main dot max patch okay I'm gonna go ahead and save it in my in class demo folder let's see if max is smart enough to keep track of this nope it didn't okay okay but just to let me bounce over to the finder just to prove to you oh there it is right there okay it's in this folder okay we would now like it to be in this project because the project is the structure that max uses to organize all these files for us okay so just like we did before, before we did add file to project, add new file, this is now an existing file. Okay, so if I switch over to existing file and I grab that two tap delay dot max pat and hit open, it's going to add it to my project. Everybody see what happened here? Zoom in. Okay. Are we able to do that? Okay. You can't find where you saved it on the hard drive? Yeah. Let's try this. Add new. Go to max project. So you're looking at document. 
Yeah, there's no search function here. Cancel. There should be. But you found it? Okay. So add that existing file, that two tap, whatever you called it. If you called it the same thing, hopefully it's easier than two tap underscore delay dot maxpat. Okay. And notice in the finder here, it it was at the same level with this file. It now max kind of took over and moved it into the patchers folder to keep things organized for you. Everybody see that? It got moved into the patchers folder. Okay. Now what you can do, because it's part of your max patch, I know this is going to sound crazy, but go ahead and delete these sub patches, the P space thing, okay. You can now, because it's part of your max project, okay, you can create a new object and you can type to tap underscore delay. Mm -hmm. Just the name of the file. And it will show up as if it's an external. Okay? So this, there's no way, just looking at this, that you could tell the difference between this and an external. There's no visual representation that tells you this is actually a patcher versus a, an external. Okay? Except that if you try to access the help file, it's going to tell you, oh, well, it's just going to open up the patch for you because there is no help file. But if you lock the patch and double click it, you'll see that original sub patch. Okay? What's nice here, you'll notice once it's actually in this patch as object state, uh, you'll notice the lock goes away down here in the, in the bar. Okay? You can't edit it from here when you've uh, double clicked it. You have to actually open up the original and make your edits. Okay? And in this situation, when you make an edit to the original, it propagates to all instances. Okay? So it keeps them all in sync with each other, which more often than not is what you actually want. Are we following so far? Okay. So the what this is called this is uh, the typical word for this is abstraction. Okay. You're taking a patch and you're abstracting it so that it can be reused. Uh, so the max terminology for this that shows up. Uh, it shows up a few times in the, uh, the, 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 the reference guides and that sort of stuff, but if you talk to any seasoned Max programmer, either in the online forums or offline or whatever, they're typically going to refer to this as an abstraction. It's a Max patch that's staved, saved in a way that you can reuse it as if it's an external. Abstraction. Okay. What's that? Okay, let me look real quick. Let me just make one more point and then I'll check it. Um, some of us even do this. And you, you notice Max doesn't care either way whether you put the Max patch or not. Okay, it's going to load it either way. Uh, I have seen a few, and I, I, this was, I don't know, I developed this habit back in Max 4. Because in Max 4, um, this actually loaded faster than this. And when you had a patch that had hundreds of these things, it could make a difference between your, 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 your performance patch loading in 30 seconds versus 10 seconds. And faster load times are always better than longer load times. So back in Max 4, this actually loaded faster than this. So I developed a habit of always putting the, the full file name there. Okay. So if you see that, but know that it's going to work in max either way. Tab six, part is here. Okay, double click. Right here. Oh, that's not actually. That's a patch that doesn't have your image now. It's supposed to tap these in future. So you didn't actually save these files. You saved the main file. So go ahead and uh, yeah, remove from project. Okay. You want to actually? Oh, I see what you did. Okay. Before we go ahead and encapsulate this again. Tell the user. Well, get that close on this. Do. Okay. Double click that. Encapsulate. Go ahead and double click it. Just so you can make sure you encapsulate it. Oh. Yeah. Oh. 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 Save this as two tap delay. 
And then add that file together, okay? Okay. So we're, we're reusing patches here as objects or creating abstractions, okay? Um, now, let's go ahead. I gave you some other files, right? Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and add those to your project. So if we go ahead and down to the, the plus symbol, add existing file, uh, navigate to wherever on the hard drive you, you found that zip file, and go ahead and select all those. Oh, it's not going to let me select all of them. I have to do them one by one. That's not cool. Can I click and drag them? Let me see if I can do that. Yeah. Clicking and dragging works. So I'm just going to click and drag them. There we go. Great. So I've just added these to my project. Okay. And it's a good idea now that we've done some stuff here to this project. We want to go ahead and hit save. Or does it not? It just automatically saves it. Oh, look at that. So it's just automatically saving stuff in the background for us for that project. So these files are now all part of my project. Okay. So if you've got the two tap delay dot max pat in your main again, go ahead and collect, connect it to your output, connect the input here. Okay. And what I'd like to do, I'd like to have another inlet here where I can actually control the delay time from up here. Okay. Because I might not need to uh, I typically don't want my delay to be hardwired. I want it to be flexible, something I can change over time. Okay, um, so I need to actually create a way to go into this object and make that change. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and open up the two tap delay patch. Okay, uh, and if I unlock it from here, is everybody able to unlock this patch? Okay. I'm going to create another inlet. I'm just going to click and drag that one. You maybe you, did you double click it or did you open it from the project menu? You have to open it from the project menu to, for it to be editable. Okay. I'm going to add a second inlet to control these delay times here, but I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to actually put a route object here. And I'm going to say delay 1, delay 2. Okay, what does route do? I know most of you have used this at some point this semester. What does route do? Looks for the specific name that you have and takes it off. Right, so it, it basically, if, it, if a message comes in that says delay one space 500, it's going to route it out this outlet and strip off the delay one and just send the 500 on down the line. Okay, same thing with delay two over here. It's going to strip off if it says delay two and send it on down the line over to the tap out. Okay, and I'm going to connect that to my inlet. And I'm, what, what we've done here and why we've done that, we've created one inlet for routing all of our control messages to specific places within the processing algorithm. So one inlet to route control messages to specific places within our processing algorithm. In this case, it's a two-tap delay. But imagine if this was a, a, a five-band filter that you could select the frequencies and the gain of each one, and you could then route them to specific places. Okay. Once I hit save on this, which I would encourage you to go ahead and do, and close it, if you come back to the main patch, you'll notice your object, your your abstraction has actually grown an extra inlet. Okay. And that is now where you can send those control messages, delay one and delay two. Okay. So if you want to just to show you that how this works, delay one. Uh, you can use a dollar sign replace, right? Delay two, dollar sign replace. And then I can have an integer box for each one. OK. 
Okay. I turn this on. Shorten this one. Da, 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 da. Change this one to 5,000. Change this one to 250. And I could talk all day long. I could give the rest of my lecture using this multi tap delay if I want. I could talk all day long. I could give the rest of my lecture using this multi tap delay if I want. If I want to shorten this one now. Now I'm using really short delays and hearing what that sounds like, yes? Okay. But you see how that changes it interactively now. Okay. I can I can change it on the fly from this top level patch and affect my abstraction in the lower level. Okay. Why would I want to have one inlet for sending multiple messages for multiple control parameters? What's the advantage there? Say again. So when you change it, uh -huh. something, you only do it once. Yeah. You don't have to go everywhere to change it. And I can add additional messages later without having to repatch my patch. So at, right now we've got two delays, but imagine I want to add a third one and add another message for delay three. Rather than adding a, a third inlet and a fourth inlet and a fifth inlet, I've got one inlet that gathers all my messages and then inside my sub patch, my abstraction, it just gets routed to the right place. Okay, so I mean, it, it's very little overhead for it to do this routing. Trust me. Okay, oh. but having it this way means that I can add extra messages later on down the line without having to restructure my patch. Okay. Um, okay. Is this making sense? Is it, you seeing why this is a powerful tool? Yeah. yeah? I had to Project. Yeah. I was doing, uh, soft Still the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's this saving it as an ex actual separate patcher and then using it with what's called an abstraction is what allows you to save it once and then reuse it multiple times. Okay. Okay. So now let's get to these other things. So I've given you a patch. Uh, Another patch as well here. Okay, so go ahead and uh, now, since it's in your project, you can actually use this nw.rii.max patch. This one here. Okay, so go ahead and create a new object and try typing that in. I'm gonna do new nw.rii.max patch. Okay, and I'm gonna have to make it a little smaller so I can fit everything on the screen. Okay. So you'll see that this actually has a few different things. You'll notice that as you float over these inlets, you get uh, these little hints. Okay, so how did I do that? Because if you float over your two tap delay, you see you go, it goes two tap delay dot max patch colon and then there's nothing, right? Okay, how did I add those hints? Okay, if I go ahead and I'm gonna double click over here in the project browser and open this up so you can see a little bit about how this works. Comments. Well, there's comments here, but if you click on an inlet, and then do command I. There's a comment line in the inspector for adding those hints. Okay. I encourage you as you build your library of these little modules to add hints along the way. Okay. Because uh, if you get in the habit of adding these hints every time, it'll make your life much easier when you try to reuse these pat these modules. Well, I mean, for you guys, you're talking two months from now. But again, I've been using Mac since 1997, so I'm pulling up things. Well, look at this. I mean, the dates on some of these. This is a patch I originally wrote in 2000, okay? So putting those hints in there for myself allows me to reuse it and know what, what to expect from this object, from this abstraction, excuse me. Okay? Um, and you can see when I made edits, basically. 
So I encourage you to add those hints as you go along because it'll make your modules a lot more useful for yourself and it makes it easier for them to share with other people, right? Okay. So what I'm doing here, uh, I've actually got, so what this does, it gives you a range of random integers. So the random number generator, obviously, remember, if you give it an argument, it's going to get, it's going to generate zero to one less than that number, okay? What I've done with this object, with this abstraction, is give you the ability to specify a range. If I want random numbers between 3 and 10, I just input 3 and 10 in my two inlets, and then every time I bang, I get a random number between 3 and 10, okay? Now I'm using the JS object here, okay, to load a little bit of JavaScript code, which if you'd like to look at it, you just double click on it in the project window, you can see what this JavaScript code does. Basically, it, it calculates the difference, it calculates the minimum, and it outputs them to the right place, okay? The reason for doing this with JavaScript versus a max patch, because I could have patched this up with several max objects, and I think that's what I did originally in 2000 before JavaScript support was added. Um, <coughs> where it gets tricky is having the match patch actually sort out which, which number is the lowest number and which is the highest number, okay? The minimum and the maximum number for calculating the distance and the minimum, okay? It's a lot easier to do that with JavaScript than it is in a max patch. That's what I found, okay? So that's why I have a little bit of JavaScript code running. So this, op this abstraction will not run unless you also have this JS object in place in your project, okay? But feel free to use it if you find it useful to say, let's see, get rid of this inspector. So now instead of, uh, I think I can do it, arguments. Did I set it up for arguments? Oh, I need to. Yeah, over here I have hidden arguments, so I can actually put the two in there. So I, you can, you actually don't need to have inlets. If you know you want random numbers between, I don't know, two hundred and one thousand, you can just put those as your two arguments. I'm going to connect that to my number box, and I'm going to connect a bang button up here. That's the way this works. So now I turn this on, and rather than picking numbers at random, I can just click. Okay. And if I want to generate a second random number, I can just duplicate this because I can reuse it, right? And maybe I don't want this one to be from 200 to 1,000. I want this one to be from 400 to uh, 1,500. Okay, I can do that. I can connect it to one bang button. I can turn this on. Okay. The reason I keep using tongue clicks because it's very easy to hear the echoes with when you have a short burst of sound. Okay. I keep using the tongue click because it's very easy to hear the effect when you have a short burst of sound like that, basically. That's the reason for that. Okay. So all of this is saved within our patch, or I mean our project, okay. Um, again, the project is going to continuously save things to the hard drive and reorganize the files for you. You do need to save your patches as you go along. I'm going to go ahead and close this though, and let's say I get it working and I really like the way it's working, but I might want to make some updates later, but I want to make sure I save this version of my project that's working in case I screw it up later by trying to add a new feature to have six taps, right? Okay. But at this point in the semester, have you had that experience where things were working and then you went to add something and it broke? Okay. Projects can save your behind in that case, okay, because what you can do here on this manage, let me zoom in a little bit here. Under manage project, okay, there's this option called snapshot. Okay, you get it to a working state, go ahead and take a snapshot of it because what it's going to do, it's going to save this max zip file, which is basically just taking your entire project, zipping it up, and saving it right next to your project. And it gives it a handy name, which is actually the date, and I'm sure this has something to do with the time. Great. I hit save. 
I go look at my finder window here. Uh, where did I have those? I had those under projects. There it is, right there. So this is my. No, where did it go? Where did I just save that? Try again here. Snapshot. Oh, I just saved it in the demo folder. Okay, so let me cancel. Let me drag it out of there. Here it is. Okay. This zip file right here is my max project all kind of condensed in that state without any changes able to make. But my project is still there as a folder structure uh, in existence. I can keep making changes. I just know that I've saved this version that was working in case I need to come back to it. Yeah? If I open this up on another computer, would we be able to find all those objects? We're going to have to link them all back up again. There, they should all be there. Uh, good question. That's actually part of this next idea that I should have covered first. So anyway, uh, let me keep that. If I hit under manage project, there's a, the first option that I kind of skipped over, consolidate. What consolidate does for you, it will actually uh, look at your patch that's in the project and if it sees any support files that are not part of Max by default, it will pull them into your project for you. So uh, uh, I've got everything in this project, so it, we're not going to see any additions here. But let's just say, oh, here, I, here's how I can do it. Let's just say I delete this random project here, okay? Rand format JS, okay? And if I go to my in class demo, I'll look in. Or not. Oh, yeah. No, I'm in the in class. Why is it doing that? The code's not there. Dude. If I hit consolidate, so notice there's no code folder there. There it is. It that consolidate button, if it finds a file that it knows you're using in your patch and it isn't in the project folder, it's gonna suck a copy of it into your project. So it's a good idea to consolidate first, then create your snapshot. Because effectively what it does is it, it pulls any support files into your project so that you, they're easily accessible. Okay. So the code is handy, obviously. Let's see, main, and there's the nw.rii. So actually, this is where, so I did a snapshot before I consolidated. So let's unclick this. Uh, Oh, look at it. They're there. They're just not in the project folder. Let me, let me get some stuff out of the way here. No, not that. Did it unzip this or not? It did not unzip it. Okay. Well, anyway. My point was going to be, oh, here it is. It put it here. They're there. Okay. So it looked like it did. I did consolidate before I, I took my snapshot, or it took a, or either that, or it consolidated before it did a snapshot. Either way, the consolidate button is is your friend, right? Because it's going to pull any fi files that you may have forgotten about that you were just using in your patch. It's going to pull a copy of them into your project for you, and then uh, the snapshot function saves uh, based on time. And so if I do another snapshot now, uh, go to the desktop. Save it there, okay. Whoa, I didn't mean to do that. What did I do? There we go, okay. Hide Max. So you see how I've now got these two versions of my project. They're only a few minutes apart from each other. But the nice thing about this is you get to a, a working stage of your project, for goodness sakes, make a snapshot, okay so that you know you can come back to it. And, that, and you can edit this name, by the way, and just leave the dot .max zip at the end of it so that it knows what type of file it is. Yes, OK. So it's, I mean, it's, it's a very basic poor man's version of version control here. But at least it gives you something where when you get to a working stage of your project, back it up, create a snapshot, save it, so that in, in case you go to add that cool feature for your presentation and it doesn't work, you can always walk back a version, okay? Make sense? Okay. Uh, I think that was all on my list. 
for project management. Any questions about all that? Ah, build collective. Yes. Yeah. So you can actually with the with this build something that you can send to somebody who does not have Max, and they can run it. It actually creates it. It, it loads a light version of Max as part of the the collective, as part of the application. Okay, there's a little bit more work involved with that. The main thing I wanted to get across to you guys today was how to manage your projects using this feature. Okay, um, I don't, some of you are looking at me like, why didn't you teach us this five weeks ago? Um, I think in order to fully appreciate what this is doing, you had to experience some of the frustration of trying to manage files. Yes, okay. This was just in, introduced in Max 6. I mean, I'd say just. That was a year ago, basically, but, or more than a year ago. Um, but uh, you, hopefully you see some of the advantage here. Oh, I didn't mention what this uh, reroute does. So one of my frustrations is there's a route object for routing multiple uh, prepends and sending them various places. There's no real inverse to the, to the route object, so I created a JavaScript version. So if you get rid of these max messages with the dollar signs, you can actually write here, say JS NW underscore reroute dot JS, and then just say delay one, delay two, and it grows outlets for you, and it's gonna prepend this one with delay one, and it will prepend this inlet with delay two, and it will send all those messages on down the line for you. Okay, so in, in terms of building interfaces, this is a nice little single object for doing multiple pre prepends to specific inlets. Okay, that's the purpose of that JS object. Okay, or JS code to be more proper. Okay, uh, Max projects. So we've used it with Max patches. We've used it with uh, JavaScript code. It will work also with sound files. So if you're if you're saving and loading sound files as part of your project, it will keep track of those too. Um, I think other media forms as well, like pictures and that sort of stuff as well. So it'll 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 keep track of all the files that you need for your project. Okay. Okay. I didn't get to start the engineering stuff, but I think this this hopefully will be of use to you, um, or it should be of use to you. Uh, I, I mean, there's two minutes, and I've got several more slides about engineering. I probably just should just wait till Tuesday to, to hit you over the head with all this engineering stuff, because if you look at this, I mean, come on. Two minutes, you want me to talk about this? <laughs> How about if I talk, introduce this one slide? Has anybody seen things like this in your readings yet? Yeah. This? What these mean? Okay, that's what I want to help, help decipher for you um, so you can become a more informed reader. Okay. Uh, let me just introduce this one concept. Square brackets basically means digital. Uh, regular parentheses means analog. Okay, so this is a, a a a formula for showing the conversion from analog to digital. This is a formula that describes an analog to digital conversion process. Here is what we're going to get into basically. Okay, uh, and then I'll start to expound on how you describe digital filters using these formulas. Okay. Because uh, almost all of the reading, well, let's see, a lot of the reading resources you're pulling from, and if you get into any uh, articles or papers that were written for the computer music conference, they're going to have some of these formulas in them that describe various filters that are used for processing. Okay, um, I'm not expecting you to become an expert at it, but I hope, hopefully, uh, we'll get you to the level where you will, you won't, you will no longer look at those things and go, this just looks like. Japanese to me or Chinese to me, and I have no idea what these characters mean. Okay, uh, at least you'll have some understanding of what those characters mean uh, going forward. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So that's next week. How to speak engineering. <laughs>